Well, we are continuing this uh, sermon series this morning on uh, facing life's uh, greatest battles. How do you survive life's greatest battles? And um, I, I mentioned last week, some of you may be here for the first time. I mentioned last week that there are two kinds of sermon series. One is where you preach a series of sermons and they're kind of held together by a common theme. And then there are sermon series where it's really one sermon that's broken up into two, three different uh, segments. And this is one of those. In order to get to get the full uh, understanding of how to face life's greatest battles, you really need to hear all three of these. Last week I preached on this topic, uh, Be Yourself, and I'll point that text out for a moment. So this is just an invitation. If you missed the first one last week, you can pick that up at, on uh, cumc.com. You can go to the archives or the sermon archives, get it on your iPhone or whatever, and um, listen to it in the next week, and that kind of will uh, complete the picture. Today we're talking on the subject be prepared. And we're using the same text each time. It's the 17th chapter of uh, 1 Samuel. Saul, let me just say, Saul is the king of the Hebrews. And the Hebrews and the uh, Philistines are, are faced against one another. And Goliath comes forth and he says, we don't need to have a big battle here. We'll, we'll do one-on-one. -on -one. Whoever can beat me, uh, you know, will de determine uh, the end of this battle. So David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. I was reading this text early this morning. I do not know how many times I've read that verse. And I thought, wow, that's a great verse. I'm going to preach a sermon on that right there. Do not let your heart fail because of some great challenge in life. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a boy and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came near and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and I struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, here's the text we preached on last week. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed with him a coat of mail. And David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I'm not used to them. And he removed them. The, the, the message last week was we're never stronger than when we were being ourselves, never weaker than when we were trying to be someone else. Uh, David knew intuitively that if he walked out there with all that armor on him, he would die at the hand of Goliath. He said, I've got to be myself. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed at David by his gods. And then the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the, to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give you the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After the sermon last week, a friend of mine emailed me and he said, Don, I'm interested in this part of the text that we read last week. It says that David uh, uh, picked up five smooth stones and put them in his shepherd's bag. And he said, I have this, these two questions. One, why did he pick up five stones? Did he think he was going to miss with the first one? 
And the second is, what is the meaning of the five smooth stones? When we read numbers in the Old Testament, New Testament as well, usually they have symbolic significance. The number three, the number seven, the number 12, the number 40, all symbolic numbers. So I'm curious about that. I said, okay, I'll research it and I'll report back in Sunday's sermon. I've researched it. Not a whole lot, I'll confess. So somebody might find out that I'm wrong about this. But as far as I can tell, there is no uh, symbolic uh, significance to the number five. My guess is that that had been David's habit through all those years out there in the wilderness with the sheep. He'd fill his pouch with five stones just to be prepared. And then, of course, uh, that's what I think uh, the reason he picked five stones. I believe that David believed that it would take one stone and one stone only. But he did what you and I would do if we were thinking properly. He said, I want to be prepared. Just in case, I'm going to be prepared. Have a little bit more ammunition. So he picks the five smooth stones. And so that's our topic today. It's on the subject of how to be prepared when we face those great battles in life. This is really an interesting story. When you first read it, the difference between David and Goliath seems to be so enormous that uh, the only one who can save David is God, just kind of reaching down there and uh, making this happen. After all, uh, Goliath, uh, there's speculation, uh, uh, scholars say that Goliath was over nine feet tall, a huge man, a battle-hardened warrior. He'd gone against many, many people. He's got armor on. David is out there by himself. It looks like there's absolutely no possibility for David to win this battle. When you read it carefully, what you discover is that David was a remarkably prepared warrior. Think about this. David had a very, very precise plan based on years and years and years of experience and practice. His plan was this. He would go out there, he would taunt Goliath, he would seduce Goliath into believing that he had nothing to fear from this young boy. Goliath would turn and face him head on, and then David would take his sling and use the shot that he had practiced all of his life thousands and thousands of times and fail the giant with one shot to the forehead. The truth of the matter is that David was a remarkable warrior the moment he stepped foot on this field. He was thoroughly prepared. It is an amazing story. When I was in high school back in the late 60s, I played football for a coach by the name of Bo Snowden. Uh, I was a great football fan, uh, especially back in those days. And Bo Snowden was the one who first told me the inside story about the great football player, Raymond Berry. Coach Snowden had played for Raymond's father in Paris, Texas. He was the high school football coach, Paris, Texas. Some of you know this. And Raymond Berry, of course, had played about 10 years earlier for his father back in the 50s. And he said Raymond Berry wanted more than anything else to be a football player. He lived and dreamed of being a football player. But there was a problem. He was small. He was born with one leg shorter than the other, and he was slow. He said he just simply wasn't a very talented football player. Raymond Berry never uh, started for his high school team until he was a senior in high school, even though his father was the coach. Raymond dreamed of playing football uh, in college, but there was this problem. He was small and he was slow, one leg shorter than the other. And so after he graduated from high school, no colleges offered him a scholarship. He walked on at SMU uh, where he made the team and had a good career at SMU. But back in those days, in the 50s, they didn't throw the ball very much. This is rather amazing when you stop and think about it. In his entire SMU career, Raymond Berry only caught 33 passes. 33 passes. He dreamed of playing professional football. But there was this problem. He wasn't all that talented. He was small and he was slow. Born with one leg shorter than the other. Nevertheless, the Baltimore Colts drafted him in the 20th round. And he went on to become one of the greatest wide receivers in the history of the game. 
This is one of those generational things. I know that those are sitting here, especially the men sitting here my age, you remember Raymond Berry and Johnny Unitas really well. There are people sitting here who never, never even heard of Johnny Unitas or Raymond Berry. But we know the story. Raymond Berry simply outworked everyone else. He and Johnny Unitas were famous for staying after practice. They threw the ball and caught it, threw the ball and caught it over and over again till they finally came to the point that they literally could read each other's minds. Arguably the greatest quarterback wide receiver duo in the history of the game. Talk about being prepared. These are two amazing facts. I think Raymond Berry played for 12 years in the, in the NFL. In the 12 years that he played for the NFL, he only dropped two passes. He fumbled one time. He racked up thousands and thousands of yards, has been inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. Just one of the most amazing players ever. Back in the 1970s, the early 1970s, I was living here in Dallas. And I picked up the Dallas Morning News one day and I was reading the sports page. Back in those days, Bob St. John, who for many years uh, wrote for the news, in those days, he was a sports reporter. And he told a story about something that he had witnessed at the Cowboys uh, training camp in Thousand Oaks, California. Tom Landry had hired Raymond Berry to be their receivers coach. And they were out there at Thousand Oaks. Many of you remember they went to Thousand Oaks for years for their training camp. And Raymond Berry was working with their receivers, the Dallas Cowboy receivers, on the down and out pass. You go down the field and out, you catch the ball right as you're getting to the, to the sideline. And he was running these receivers through this pattern. They ran it over and over again. And Raymond Berry got frustrated because they weren't doing it as precisely as he wanted them to do it. He said, finally, he said, let me show you how to do it. And so he took his position, he ran down the field, ran to the sideline, the quarterback threw the ball, he caught the ball perfectly, but landed with one foot out of bounds. He said, that wasn't right, let me do it again. So he ran the pattern again, went down the field, headed for the sideline, caught the pass, but again, one foot out of bounds. He said, something's not right here. He ran the, he ran the pattern a couple of other times, and he came back. There were a lot of coaches standing around, trainers, and the whole football team, and he said this, this football field is too narrow. <laughs> and that's exactly the way they reacted. They laughed at him. He said, no, no, I'm serious. This, this football field is too narrow. One of the coaches explained to him, he said, Raymond, we've been coming to this field for years and years and years. It is the home field for, I think it's California Lutheran College. There's no way, this is a regulation size football field. There's no way it's too narrow. Raymond Berry made the trainers go get a measuring tape. They measured the field and it was two feet too narrow and had been for years and years and years. Raymond Berry had run that pattern so many times in his life that he knew exactly where each foot was going to be at any second in time. He was probably the most prepared football player to ever set foot on an NFL field. He had his 10,000 hours of experience, to use Malcolm Gladwell's term. He knew what he was doing. Well, that's David's story, isn't it? If you stop and think about it, it looks like that this was, this was a mismatch, that, jo, that God just reached down and helped uh, David slay Goliath. It wasn't the case at all. David was prepared. He claimed his experience. He claimed his 10,000 hours of practice with the sling. We didn't read it this morning, but early in the text you see it. His brothers ridiculed him. Saul doubted him. But David realized by claiming his experience that God had been preparing him for this moment all of his life. You stop and think about when you read this, you can see David literally uh, rehearsing all of those years that he was out there in the wilderness. He rehearsed mentally every battle he ever fought. He said, I remember when I fought the lion and I, and I killed it. I remember when I fought the bear. It's not all in there, but I'm sure the rattlesnake. He went through all those years that he spent on the, uh, uh, in the wilderness protecting the, the sheep. He thought about those 10,000 times he had thrown 
that rock with absolute precision. And when he stepped onto this field, he had a precise plan. And he knew that God had prepared him for this moment. Well, you might be saying this morning, well, those are, those are two great stories, Don. The story of David whipping Goliath, that Raymond Berry story, the most prepared football player ever. But how does that really apply to my life if tomorrow I find myself in one of the greatest battles of my life? If tomorrow I go to my doctor and I discover I have cancer, or if, if tomorrow afternoon my boss calls me in and says, you no longer have a job in this place. How does it apply to me? Well, let me suggest uh, three things to you. First of all, realize that David had not been preparing for Goliath all his life. He didn't know he would be facing Goliath. What he did was that he reached back and claimed the experience, all the different experiences that God had given him. And so that's the first thing that we do as human beings. We claim the experiences that God has already given to us. I, um, I have a really good friend who um, is in the ministry. When she was in college back in the 80s, she went to her counselor. She felt like she was being called to ministry. And so she went to her counselor, happened to be a woman. And she said, you know, I believe I'm being called to the ministry. And her counselor didn't just discourage her. She just, she said, no, 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 women don't do ministry. That's, you must be mistaken somehow. And so she talked to my friend out of, uh, pursuing that particular uh, pathway. So she got a degree in computer science and she became a very, very successful employee of a large technology company. She later realized that God was in fact calling her into ministry. She went to seminary. She's now an ordained Methodist minister, one of my colleagues. I was talking the other day uh, with our new bishop about her. I said, you know, she's such an extraordinary example of how God prepares us in different ways. Because uh, all of those years that she was working in business trained her and gave her so many experiences that are so unique and that are missing in 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 the backgrounds of so many ministers. They've helped her to become an extraordinarily, extraordinarily effective pastor. So when you're facing your next battle, let me promise you that God has already prepared you in ways you may not be aware of. Just think back over your life the way David did. You know how David rehearsed all of those battles he had been in? Think back over your life the way David did. All of the battles, all of the challenges you've been through in all of your life. And you will discover that you survived. Sometimes you even triumphed. And that all of those things you were learning in those moments, in those former battles, will apply to you as you face this new challenge. That God has been preparing you even when you weren't aware of it. The second thing I want to uh, suggest is that you claim the support of family and friends. I've gotten to this age where Um, occasionally I'll get invited to go and speak to a group of young pastors. I think it's because of the gray hair. I don't know. If people see gray hair and mine's gotten plenty gray, they assume that you've got some kind of accumulated wisdom or insight. I don't know. Um, But occasionally I get invited. I uh, went to Arkansas uh, two or three years ago and spoke to a group here and there. And I always, generally I make uh, different uh, kinds of uh, addresses depending on what it is they're asking for. But there's one thing that I tell every group that I meet with, and that is this. Everybody needs three things. You need a friend, and by that I mean someone to whom you can tell anything. You know they will not betray you, they'll keep your confidence. They may not agree with you, but they will not judge you. You need a coach or a mentor Someone who will straighten you out now and then tell you the truth, help you grow, and you need a group. You need a group. And whenever I tell this to people, I always notice everybody's shaking their heads. They always agree with it. I'm amazed at how many people don't have all three of those those things, a friend, a mentor, a coach, and a group. 
I can approach this from a different uh, angle by just uh, talking about what we have learned from our friends uh, in this congregation, our sober alcoholics. They will tell you, and they know, that when you face life's greatest battle, you have to have a friend and a sponsor and a group. So it's really, really important. When you face life's greatest challenges, make sure you have the support that is available to you. It's not really in today's text, but we know it was there for David. And then finally, you claim your faith. We're going to talk about this more in more detail next week when we talk about trusting in God. But it's such an important factor uh, in this story. We talked about it last week, so we'll talk about it this, way, this week. You, you, uh, you claim your faith. David, whenever he was preparing for this battle and when he was speaking with Saul and then again when he's speaking to, the, uh, to Goliath, he claims the fact that God is with him that God is with him. And he somehow is remarkably strengthened in the knowledge that God will never desert him. This past Friday, I don't do very many memorial services anymore, but this past Friday, I stood right here and did the memorial service for a friend of mine, Earl Johnson, who passed away last week. And I, I read the eighth chapter of Romans. I was thinking about it. I've been in the ministry for over 40 years, and I've never, ever, ever done a memorial service or a funeral without reading the eighth chapter, that closing paragraph from the eighth chapter of Romans. Paul's great words, you remember them? For nothing in life or in death, in this world or in the world to come, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what I think. David has spent all those years out there in the wilderness by himself with the sheep and the wild animals. It surely was a lonely existence. But out there he had discovered this remarkable truth about the one whom he called Lord, that he was not alone that there was a powerful presence with him that would not desert him. And when he got ready to step on the field of battle with Goliath, he knew that God would be there. So claim your faith. When you get ready to meet the greatest battle of your life, claim your experience, claim the support of friends and family, and claim the remarkable good news that God will never desert you. Thanks be to God. Amen.